In this video, we'll talk about the heart, the basic anatomy of the heart, the location of the heart, um, the tissue that makes up the heart, the chambers, the valves, the basic way that the valves uh, work, where they're located, and also the path that blood takes through the heart. So um, taking a look at a picture, we're on page 8 in the notes, that's where the heart information starts. Taking a look at a picture, we can see, and you already know, I'm sure, where the heart is located in the thorax. So it's protected by the rib cage, which you can see here. And taking a look at this picture, you can see that it's between the right and left lungs. So here's uh, the right lung, here's the left lung, uh, the heart and the great blood vessels and lymph nodes are located in between the two lungs and this area is known as the mediastinum. Okay, so it's located in the mediastinum and it's situated such that the, you know, large portion of the heart, if you want to think of this kind of like a triangle shape, is located superiorly at the top. Um, that's known as the base of the heart, which is unusual, you know, for the base of an organ to be the superior surface. And then the pointy tip of the heart uh, that's known as the apex. So the heart is an organ that's contained within serous membranes. You might remember serous membranes from AP1. It's uh, simple squamous epithelial tissue, and it's always in a double layer. So um, the heart is enclosed in serous membrane. It's called the pericardium. And I want to talk about the structure of the heart, and let's start with the pericardium. Okay, so we'll go from the outside in. So taking a look at this picture from our book, what they're doing here is they're um, drawing an analogy that I, I love to use with the fist into the uh, balloon. So imagine a balloon that's not blown up, you know, all the way so that you could sink a fist into it. You'd have part of the balloon that's touching the fist, right? And the fist is representing the heart. This part of the balloon or serous membrane is what's known as the visceral pericardium. The visceral pericardium is the actual outside of the heart. It's the actual outside of the organ. And just like you can see in the balloon, um, it's continuous, of course, with like this outer layer. So this outer layer, this part of the balloon would be called the parietal pericardium. So the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium are in contact with each other just like the balloon analogy, the visceral pericardium being the actual outside of the heart, the parietal pericardium being the outer layer, and then the airspace of the balloon. This is what's known as the pericardial cavity, and it's filled with serous fluid. The serous fluid is being produced by the visceral and the parietal pericardium, and so the serous fluid fills this area, and so the heart is beating within a fluid-filled sac, which you probably are familiar with that too. Now, because this is, you know, a muscular organ and it's in constant state of uh, motion, basically, and it's in this fluid-filled sac, you can imagine that the parietal pericardium, which we just said it's simple squamous epithelial tissue, that is not going to be strong enough to contain this structure. And so uh, what there is, is uh, a layer of connective tissue of really like fibrous connective tissue that um, encases, you know, surrounds this whole area. And so that's known as the fibrous pericardium. And I'm going to show you a better picture than my markup, but hopefully this makes sense. The fibrous pericardium is actually lined with the parietal pericardium. Then we'd have the pericardial cavity filled with the serous fluid and then the visceral uh, pericardium inside of that. So, um, taking a look at a better picture. So this is a picture from our book, and what they're doing is just taking um, a little piece of the wall of the heart and zeroing in on that. So here's the chamber of the heart. This is where the blood is contained inside of the heart. And so we started from outside of the heart. And so see if uh, you can follow along here. This is the fibrous pericardium. So that's that uh, fibrous connective tissue that we just talked about encasing everything. And right out inside of the fibrous pericardium would be the parietal pericardium. So there's the parietal pericardium lining the fibrous pericardium. And we can see how it's continuous with, this is the visceral pericardium. Now the visceral pericardium 
is also known as the epicardium, and it is the outside of the organ. This space in between the visceral and the parietal pericardium is the pericardial cavity. That's the space that's filled with serous fluid. And then to finish off with the heart, uh, inside of the visceral pericardium is the myocardium. So you can see this is a very uh, thick layer. All this pink region is the myocardium. That's cardiac muscle. Okay, so it's a thick wall of cardiac muscle, and that's what's going to, you know, move the blood through the organ. And then lining the chambers of the heart is um, endothelium, which when it lines the heart, it's called endocardium. And endothelium is simple squamous epithelial tissue that's lining the cardiovascular system. So that is the wall of the heart. I did write that out in the notes. Let me show you. So taking a look at the heart notes, we can see heart is located in the mediastinum. That's the area between the two lungs encased in the pericardial sac. Okay, so the pericardial sac, what that is, it are the two parts that we talked about. It's the fibrous pericardium, the fibrous encasement that's lined with the parietal pericardium. I also made a note how the wide base is at the top of the heart and then the tip of the heart is the apex. Now, Right inside of the pericardial sac would be the pericardial cavity, and that's the fluid-filled space. It's serous fluid that's being produced by the serous membranes, and the heart is beating in that area. And then the visceral pericardium is the outside of the heart. It's known as the epicardium. Myocardium is the muscular portion of the wall of the heart, and then the endocardium is the endothelium. So the endothelium, that's continuous with blood vessels. We haven't talked about that yet, um, so we'll talk about that next week. So in other words, when blood is flowing through the cardiovascular system, it's only in contact with this one tissue. If it ever contacted anything different, that's what's going to stimulate it to a clot. So moving on to the um, chambers of the heart, I'm going to move to the PowerPoint. I'm going to move to um, a blank slide because I thought what I would do is uh, draw this out the way I like to teach it face to face and, and see if this makes sense because it's actually really, you know, straightforward. So the heart is a four chambered organ. So I'm going to draw it just like this, like a box. Okay, so we have our four chambers. There are two chambers on the top, those are called the atria. And then the two chambers on the bottom, those are called the ventricles. So the um, valves, the location of the, oh, well, let me talk about right and left first. So the right atrium would be this chamber. Notice that when you're looking at this, how the right atrium is on our left side. So this is like the patient is facing you. And it's really important to get that correct. Okay, any mistake on right and left is going to be 100% incorrect. And so uh, make sure that you understand that we're looking at, we're talking about the patient's right and the patient's left, not our personal right and left. So here's the left atrium, uh, right ventricle, left ventricle. So the valves of the heart. When blood enters into the heart, it enters in uh, to the atria. So it enters in at the... Um, top of the heart. And I'm just going to draw the, the, the blood green for now. Okay, so blood enters in through the top of the heart and it enters into um, both the right and left atria. The right and left atria are separated by what's called the interatrial septum. And so the blood in the right atrium does not mix with the blood in the left atrium. Okay, so that's where blood is entering and then uh, the blood will flow from the atria into the ventricles. Okay, so there's going to be an opening for that to happen. And once the blood is in the ventricles, just like with the atria, uh, the blood on the right side of the heart will not mix with the blood on the left side of the heart. In between the two ventricles is a very muscular interventricular septum that separates the two. So when blood exits the heart, it exits from the ventricles. So it's going to exit out of the right ventricle, and it's going to exit out of the left ventricle. So when you look at it like this, you can see how it's kind of like two parallel pumps. Something's happening on the right, something's happening on the left. It's happening at the same time, 
and the blood on the right and the blood on the left don't mix. So as far as the valves, you know, where are the valves? We have two sets of valves in the heart, and you can see I have three, you know, circles drawn on my diagram. So, you know, I'm wondering if you know, you know, where the valves are located. You know, think about that for a second. You know, are there valves that guard the entrance into the heart, into the atria? The answer to that question is no. There are no valves located there. So this is going to be just a wide opening. Okay, so blood can continually and freely come into both atria. There's no valve located there. The first set of valves are located in between the atria and the ventricles. Those are called the atrioventricular valves, or people just say AV valves for short. Uh, so blood, oh, when it leaves the atrium, singular, would move through the AV valve into the ventricle. So the AV valves separate the atria from the ventricles, and then there are uh, another set of valves that control um, that control blood movement between the ventricle and then this would be a blood vessel, right? So we're ejecting it from the heart into uh, a blood vessel. So those are called the semilunar valves as a category. And actually, each of these valves has an individual name. So taking a look at the AV valves, the AV valve on the right is called the tricuspid valve. The AV valve on the left is called the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve same thing. The semilunar valves, uh, on the right, it's the pulmonary semilunar valve, and on the left, it's called the aortic semilunar valve. So that is the basic placement of um, the chambers, the valves, uh, blood on the right doesn't mix with blood on the left, and so conceptually, this is you know, if you understand this, it makes it a lot easier to then look at the um, actual heart and, and figure it out. So let's try to do that. Let's look at uh, a picture. Okay, so taking a look at this picture from our book, let's see if we recognize all of those areas. So here I can see is where blood is entering in. You can see there's just a wide open hole there. There's no valve. This is the right atrium. And then this uh, white kind of fibrous looking thing, all of this with these little strings. I'll talk about that in a second. This is the tricuspid valve. And then all of this space in red. This is the right ventricle. And here's where my real simple diagram differs from the actual, well, I guess in you know every way it differs from the actual anatomy, but uh, here's where it really, really differs. When the blood exits the uh, ventricle, that semilunar valve is actually located right up in the same plane as the AV valve. So there's that pulmonary semilunar valve that we talked about, so that when the blood exits the ventricle, it actually gets pumped out of the top of the heart into a blood vessel. This blood vessel is called the pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary trunk splits into the right and the left pulmonary arteries, and the pulmonary arteries are carrying the blood out to the lungs. Blood goes out to the lungs, it becomes oxygenated. We talk about that in our next unit. So take my word for it for, for now, and when the blood returns to the heart, it's going to return through the pulmonary veins. So pulmonary veins uh, enter in, and there would be two more openings over here for the right pulmonary veins, but they're just being eclipsed by this blood vessel into the left atrium. Blood will flow from the left atrium through Again, this white fibrous structure along with the strings, this is the bicuspid uh, valve or the mitral valve. The left ventricle is all of the space inside of this chamber. And then we can see the aortic semilunar valve peeking out there. So you can see how all of the valves are in a single plane. So that if we took the heart and we chopped it into a top and a bottom, Okay, so let's say we're going to take a blade and we're going to cut through where the valves are. We could actually see all four valves in one plane. Okay, the atria are superior and then the ventricles are inferior. And to show you that, our book gives us a picture of that. So taking a look at this um, here, they cut through the plane where the valves are located. 
uh, these big valves, these are the AV valves. And you can see how when the AV valve is shut on the right, how it has three segments. That's how it got the name tricuspid valve. When the AV valve is shut on the left, you can see how there's these two segments. That's how it got the name bicuspid valve. And then the semilunar valves, you can see, have a very different structure. Uh, both of them have the same structure. They're made out of three little cusps of uh, tissue that kind of lean against each other like a tripod. Okay, so they're, it's very stable. And then here is uh, a photo of the AV valves. Those valves are open, and then you can see the semi-lunar valves. So taking a look at the uh, other picture, let's go back to this one. Taking a look at this picture, let's take a look at the valves a little bit more closely. So you can see how the AV valves look very um, kind of like a like fibrous, like a like a sheet of tissue. They are. Uh, an analogy that I use for the AV valves is like a shower curtain. So you know how, um, let's say we had like a circular opening, which is what you have here. Keep in mind this is being cut in half, so we only see half of that. And if we had a shower curtain, say, like dangling down from this um, circular uh, rod, that's how you can think of this. It's like this fibrous material that kind of hangs down, and it's anchored by these little strings, these are called the cordae tendinii, two little mounds of muscle in the ventricles called papillary muscle. And so the cordae tendinii, that's the way that the AV valve is stabilized, and it prevents it from blowing back into the atria. So as long as blood is flowing in the correct direction from the atria to the ventricle, you can see it's going to go right through that curtain, so to speak. Um, but when pressure starts building up in the ventricle, that's actually what's going to shut the AV valve. I'm going to show you another picture of that in a minute. Uh, with the semilunar valve, you can see that it's made out of these cusps and how it has like this um, depression on the superior surface so that blood would be able to sit right on top of it. And it works kind of like a swinging door. You know, if you had enough pressure inside of the ventricle, what would happen is blood could just push through this kind of like a swinging door. And then when the pressure is lower and the, the cusps shut, they rest against each other. So maybe surprisingly, the heart valves are not controlled by the nervous system. They just open and close based on um, mechanical reasons. So let's go back to the notes. Okay, so in the notes, um, I talk about the atria and the ventricles. Some of this I've showed you, some of this, um, maybe I'll switch back and forth to some pictures. So taking a look at the atria, those are the superior chambers. They're on the right and on the left. Uh, the interatrial septum, we talked about that, completely separates the right and left atria. The atria are smaller, weaker chambers uh, than the ventricles, and they receive blood that's entering into the heart. So I would say we have talked about all of that. When the atria are empty, uh, their deflated appearance from the surface of the heart is known as an oracle. So you'll hear that term, I think, especially in lab. I'm going to switch to a picture and then jump back. So looking at this picture, this is a dissection of a heart. Here's the right atrium. Or do you see how actually there's no blood in it and it kind of shrinks up and it looks like a little flap? Uh, and they're calling it the right oracle. So, uh, so this is the right oracle, okay, or right atrium. But oracle just means that it's not filled with blood and it's deflated and it looks like a little flap like ear on the top of the heart. Okay. Pectinate muscles uh, can be found um, lining the right atrium and the auricles. And pectinate muscle, it's just um, kind of like a like stringy, like a comb-like muscle. I'm going to show you another dissection. So here they're opening up um, uh, an atrium and you see all this linear, it looks like roots of a plant. Uh, that's pectinate muscle. So we can see that in the right atrium. You might be able to see that if you do the sheep heart dissection. Take a look for that. So jumping back over to the notes, ventricles, those are the inferior chambers of the heart found on the right and the left. The interventricular septum separates the right and the left, so the blood doesn't mix. These are larger, stronger chambers. And the reason for that is, you know, if you think about where the blood is going, 
the blood in the atria, we know it's just going down to the ventricles. So it's not going to take a lot of, you know, pressure to get the blood into like a neighboring chamber. Compared to the uh, ventricles, these are going to have to pump blood out of the heart. And so you're going to have to pump the blood with more force uh, to do that. And so they're larger and they're more muscular. And actually, um, one one side of uh, the heart, one, one ventricle is larger than the other. We'll take a look at that in a few minutes. The trabeculae carnii, it's, it's similar to pectinate muscle in that you're looking at muscle that's inside of the, the chamber. <coughs> Pardon me. So taking a look at this picture, oops, do you see all of this little, um, or if you remember the trabeculae from bone, all this kind of like spicule, needle-like arrangement of muscle that we can see in the ventricles, that's what's known as the trabeculae carni. Okay, it's just that needle-like arrangement. You can see that in both ventricles. So as far as the valves go, we looked at the valves too. I put um, a picture in your notes to try to explain how the valves work, because like I said, they're just opening and closing based on mechanical reasons. So this is a picture of the AV valves. So the AV valves, remember, are going to um, be in between the atria. So this would be an atrium. And then down here, this would be the ventricle. So we can see the AV valve, tricuspid or bicuspid, doesn't matter. They both work the same way. We can see the cordy tendinii anchoring it down to the papillary muscle, these mounds of muscle. So what happens when the uh, valve is open is blood is just going to automatically flow from the atria to the ventricles. Um, and also when the atria contract, that's going to push blood through um, the AV valves. And can you imagine that as the blood gets pushed into the ventricles, how the blood level is going to start rising in the ventricle. That's what I'm trying to draw here, like a blood level. Because I want you to try to picture that as blood enters into the ventricle and starts filling up the ventricle, what's going to happen is the blood is going to apply pressure to the outside of this AV valve, and that's what causes it to close. So if you take a look at this picture, this uh, dark um, coloring is the blood. And so what happens is the blood, kind of like air underneath the parachute, goes up underneath the AV valve and forces it shut. But luckily, because of the cordy tendinii, we can kind of see that here, holding on to this muscular papillary muscle, those mountains of muscle, it keeps the valve shut. Okay, so that's the way the AV valve works. That as long as blood is flowing in the correct direction, that's great, but eventually pressure in the ventricle is going to rise as blood fills the ventricle, and that's going to cause the AV valve to close. Now looking at the semilunar valves, uh, semilunar valves we looked at already, and they have, um, you know what, let me go back to this just to mark this up, since I didn't do that, sorry. Um, make sure I covered everything here. So with um, the AV valves, it's composed of a fiber sheet of connective tissue anchored into the opening connecting the atrium and the ventricle. This fiber fiber sheet extends into the ventricles, kind of like the shower curtain analogy that I told you about. Its lower border is attached to ventricles through these fibrous strings, the cordy tendinii, that are attached to papillary muscle. Okay, and the names. So we did uh, cover that. So it regulates uh, blood flow in one direction from the atrium to the ventricles, and then they're going to open and close in response to pressure. Okay, we're good there. Semilunar valves. Uh, are made of the three wedge-shaped pieces of thick connective tissue, and what they do is they rest against each other. They have a cup-like depression. We looked at that. On the right, it's the pulmonary semilunar valve, and on the left, it's the aortic semilunar valves. They also regulate flow in one direction, and that is blood is going from the ventricle into the blood vessel, so it's being ejected from the heart. And so the way that these valves work, which is also due to you know, mechanical reasons, so just taking a look at these pictures, let's mark this up. Uh, so this would be the ventricle, this would be the blood vessel. So when the ventricle contracts, what that's going to do is it's going to create so much pressure in the ventricle 
that the ventricular pressure is going to exceed the pressure in the blood vessel. And when the ventricles contract, like a pressure cooker, build up all this pressure, what will happen is these semilunar vaults, like the swinging door, just blow open, blood gets ejected from the heart. That's what we're seeing with that dark arrow. And then uh, what will happen is as blood is ejected, you can see blood is building up out here. And so you can imagine the pressure is starting to increase out here, right? The blood pressure is increasing out here. Meanwhile, the blood pressure is decreasing in the ventricle because the ventricle is technically ejecting blood. It's getting rid of the blood, so the pressure is going to come down, plus the ventricle is going to start to relax. And so what will happen is this blood that's in a high-pressure area, as soon as the pressure is lower in the ventricle, it'll say, okay, you know, I'm out of the blood vessel. I'll just go back in the ventricle. And so when the blood backflows to go into the ventricle, it goes into that little cup-like depression, and that's what's going to snap this valve shut. So if you get backflow of blood, it snaps it shut. It's not going to let any of that blood go back into the ventricle. It's going to trap it out in the blood vessel. That is how the semilunar valves function, both the pulmonary and the aortic semilunar valve. So heart sounds, you know how uh, we can listen to the heart with a stethoscope? We all know, you know, the sound of a beating heart. It's described as lub-dub, and what we're hearing are the valves closing. So, you know, we're not hearing muscle contracting. You probably know that. So when the valve, AV valves close, that's the first sound. And when the semilunar valves close, that is the second sound. So to finish up this video, what I would like to do is talk about the path of blood flow through the heart. Okay, the pulmonary circuit, the systemic circuit, and the coronary circuit. So let's take a look at a picture from the PowerPoint. Okay, so in this picture, they're showing us with um, color coding the path of blood flow through the heart. So let's start here at, at the person. What they're trying to show us is that, uh, first of all, the red color means that that's oxygenated blood, okay? The, the blue, we would probably just call this deoxygenated blood. That's what I'm going to call it, okay? It's, it has less oxygen in it. So oxygenated blood enters into all of our body tissues, okay? it's delivered to all of our body tissues, the oxygen literally leaves, physically leaves the blood, goes into the tissue. We'll talk about that in the next unit. And that's how the blood becomes deoxygenated. So the deoxygenated blood, the blood that gave away its oxygen to the tissues, it will return to the heart. Okay, so this deoxygenated blood from all over the body, head to toe, obviously we're skipping a lot of blood vessels here, will return to the heart in uh, to, on the right side of the heart, to um, the right atrium. So blood that's coming from the head and the upper limbs will return through the superior vena cava, and blood that's returning from the legs and the trunk will enter into the inferior vena cava. Either way, you can see the superior and inferior vena cava both lead into the right atrium. The right atrium is receiving deoxygenated blood from the body. That deoxygenated blood is going to pass through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, and then it will pass out of the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk, which splits into the pulmonary arteries, the right and left pulmonary arteries, and those arteries go out to the lungs. Okay, so here we can see that blood is going to be delivered to the lungs. That blood is going to go through the capillary beds of the lungs. And as that blood flows through the lungs, it will come to equilibrium with the oxygen um, pressure in the lungs. And so as long as we're breathing, oxygen is continually coming into our lungs. And so what happens is when the blood leaves the lungs, that blood has been oxygenated. And that oxygenated blood is going to return to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary veins. There are uh, two pulmonary veins on the right, two pulmonary veins on the left. Uh, all the pulmonary veins lead into the left atrium. So the left atrium is collecting that oxygenated blood that's being um, delivered from the lungs. That blood will go from the left atrium through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. 
when the left ventricle contracts, that blood is going to pass through the aortic semilunar valve and get d delivered to the body. And so that's where the oxygenated blood is coming from. And so people um, call this two different circuits. So the right side of the heart, you can see, is kind of functioning as a circuit for deoxygenated blood to travel out to the lungs. And then the left side of the heart is acting as a circuit for oxygenated blood to be delivered to the body. Okay, so the right side of the heart is what people call the pulmonary circuit. The pulmonary circuit is delivery of deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And then the systemic circuit, the system, right? The systemic circuit is the left side of the heart delivering oxygenated blood out to the body. So this is, say, for instance, tracing one drop of blood through the heart, if you want to think of it that way. Because the whole heart does work together, and I'm going to talk about that in a different video to put this all together because it's important to understand this path of blood flow first. So again, if we were like tracing one red blood cell, it was if it was deoxygenated, it would go through the right side of the heart, go out to the lungs, become oxygenated, get delivered to the left side of the heart, and then get delivered to the body, and so on. Okay, so that's the path of blood flow. So you might wonder about blood flow to the heart muscle itself, because all of this blood inside of the atrium, the ventricles, does not serve the heart. So in other words, the heart does not use, you know, the oxygen, the oxygenated blood that's in the chambers of the heart. It's just simply working as a pump. But there's a lot of muscle tissue, and we've certainly all heard of um, a heart attack. So, you know, what is that? How can you be uh, at a loss of oxygen when you're talk, talking about an organ that's filled with oxygenated blood. So let me let me show you what that is about. If you take a look at um, the outside of, of the heart, you can see the uh, coronary vessels on the surface. These coronary vessels, the coronary arteries and coronary veins, these are the vessels that deliver oxygenated blood to the myocardium. So this is where um, these vessels that are on the surface of the heart, this is where the heart muscle itself is going to get its oxygen and nutrients. And it's really hard to see in a picture like this where exactly these vessels are coming from. And so let's look at this picture from our book. This is a really nice picture that makes the whole heart transparent so that maybe you can see better. Uh, here's the aorta, okay, that candy cane type top. Okay, so here's... There, this is eclipsing it uh, a little bit. So is the pulmonary trunk. Okay, so this pulmonary trunk is eclipsing it a little bit with the atria. But if you understand, that's the aorta that I just outlined in black. Do you see how before the aorta even um, hits the brachiocephalic artery, okay, before like the big branches of the aorta on the top, that there are two vessels that are coming off of the aorta? Those are the right and the left coronary arteries. So when oxygenated blood is pumped from the ventricle into the aorta, actually the first two exits off of the aorta are the coronary arteries, and they're going to deliver blood to the myocardium. So these coronary vessels are going to infiltrate the myocardium, deliver oxygen, and, um, you know, basically... Uh, branch out into teeny tiny capillary beds. So taking a look at this, this is a, uh, an incredible dissection where we can see the coronary arteries on top of the um, myocardium. And so what you can do to make a model of this, which is really cool, is you can inject uh, latex, um, like liquid latex, like a latex uh, solution into the coronary arteries and you can push it through the whole coronary circuit. So you could push that latex dye enough of it so it goes through all the coronary arteries and it goes into the capillary beds and then the venules and it comes back out, you know, the veins. So we could fill it. And then you could let that um, solidify. And after it solidifies, we could degrade away the rest of the heart, creating uh, a model like this. So this is a plastinated model where you can see how extensive the capillary beds are that are servicing the heart. This is why it is 
possible to uh, have some type of blockage because these vessels are super small and if there is some type of blockage in a coronary vessel it will act like a dam so that everything all the coronary muscle downstream from that doesn't receive any oxygen um, taking a look at this picture uh, the same thing so here they filled the coronary circuit with a dye and then degraded away the heart so you can see how fine it's like a leaf skeleton uh, how fine and tiny uh, the capillary beds are. But once blood has um, circulated through the heart, it will return um, through coronary veins. So now we're looking at the posterior surface of the heart. So again, here's the anterior surface of the heart. I can see the coronary veins, but I wanted to show you the posterior surface because the coronary veins all merge on the back of the heart in this big kind of like bulging vessel. It's called the coronary sinus. So the coronary sinus is collecting all the deoxygenated blood that was used by the heart. And guess where it puts it? Right back into the right atrium, right? So it plugs it right back into the right atrium. And it will join the rest of the um, deoxygenated uh, blood and get circulated out to the lungs again. So jumping back to the notes the pulmonary uh, circulation is on the right side of the heart and I kind of traced through like I did in um, the picture uh, where it's going so it goes into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary trunk splits into the pulmonary arteries and then it's going out to the lungs the systemic circulation, the left side of the heart, is receiving oxygenated blood from the right and left lungs uh, in um, the right and left atria, or pardon me, in the left atrium, goodness, <laughs> in the left atrium through the um, right and left pulmonary veins. Once that oxygenated blood is in the left atrium, it's going to go through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle, and then it's going to exit the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valve uh, into the aorta, and then get distributed throughout the body. The coronary circulation is that some of the oxygenated blood entering into the aorta, some of it uh, coming from the left ventricle will be diverted into the right and left coronary arteries, those vessels that I showed you that are coming right off the base of the aorta. They branch out within the myocardium, providing the heart itself with the oxygenated blood. Deoxygenated blood, the blood that was used by the my myocardium, is going to be in the coronary veins, but it all collects on the back of the heart at the coronary sinus, which then empties that deoxygenated blood right back into the right atrium, so it's right back in the um, pulmonary circuit again. So thank you for watching till the end, and uh, we'll pick it up from here in the next video. Thank you.